The University of Bologna, Italy, established in the year 1088. The University of Oxford, England, established in 1096. The University of Salamanca, Spain, 1134. The University of Paris, 1160. And the comparatively youthful University of Cambridge, 1209. These are some of the oldest, most prestigious Western universities in the world. Beyond their age, they share some things in common with modern universities. They are centres of learning, they teach tens of thousands of students, they are home to thousands of scholars, and they all have financial benefactors. The difference between these ancient universities and modern ones lies not so much in their age, faculty or students, but in their funders. The ancient universities were subsidised by monarchs, bishops and cities. Not so with modern universities. Today, revenue is hard to come by. It comes from tuition, some of it from state governments, and critically, from, in the US context at least, the federal government. It is this last category, the federal funding of US universities, specifically a large southern state university, the University of South Carolina, that is the subject of today's podcast. To help us understand this exceptionally important topic, we are joined by the University of South Carolina's Vice President for Research, Julius Fridrickson. Professor Fridrickson, welcome to Take on the South. Thanks, Mark. I'm happy to be here. We are delighted to have you. Um, This is complicated stuff, Julius, and it's important stuff too, probably much more important to the University of South Carolina and the state than most people realize. So we're very grateful to have you explain this to us. Um, But before we get into the nitty gritty, just tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you from? Um, Where did you do your, your undergraduate and graduate work? Things of that nature. So I'm, I'm born and raised in Iceland. And um, I'm a first-generation college student. Started my college career at the University of Iceland in economics. I realized pretty quickly that that was not uh, probably a good fit for me. I dropped out of college, taught a couple of years high school, and then went back to college in the United States at the University of Central Florida, primarily because it was a cheap destination as far as flying from Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to do it as economically as possible. Got my master's degree, bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Central Florida in speech and hearing sciences. And then went on to do my uh, PhD in the same field at the University of Arizona. So so actually the economics course worked really, didn't it? I mean, you found the cheapest route. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, yeah. And so first generation college student, interesting. Um, I am too, and I often think that being the first in your family to go alerts you to some of the extraordinary privileges of being a student at a university. Um, and my parents are always very proud that I'd gone, and quite frankly amazed that I'd actually got in. Um, but looking back on it, I'm sort of quite glad that I was the first, and uh, the only so far, to be sure. Yeah, the expectations certainly were not there for me. I think that the most likely path for me would have probably been a blue-collar job. That's Mm -hmm. what all of my family did. And I'm talking about not just my immediate family, but my extended family, which is very large. We were just not college-going people. Yeah, yeah, and that's the difference between, I think, a European background and American was a generational shift. More people went to university earlier. Um, What exactly does the vice president for research do? What is your remit, your job description at the University of South Carolina? Oh, it's a lot of things. So I would say that I do everything from being sort of a core administrator, helping with the overall research endeavor, certainly federal funding, state funding, helping out faculty get uh, uh, grants, and also um, being in charge of our uh, research enterprise as far as uh, as, um, animal research, making sure that we're abiding by ethical rules in treating human beings who are participants in research, and then all the way over to being just a cheerleader for the faculty and helping them out with the sources of funding uh, and mentoring, which is a big part of, of my sort of plan for the future and improving our research endeavor. You're wearing lots of hats, and I don't know how you do it all, but we'll, we'll get to some of the nitty-gritty on that later. Um, it, just for the sake of our listeners, can you sort of tell us the aerial funding streams for a university, especially the University of South Carolina? I mean, where does our funding come from? It comes from different streams. Can you kind of take us through where we get our money? 
So most of our money comes from tuition, right? Mm -hmm. by, by far the most amount of money. And that has been changing certainly over the past few decades. Most public universities got their primary funding from the state. Mm -hmm. But with, the, with dwindling state allocations for higher education, we've had to turn over to uh, uh, running our enterprise very much on tuition. But as a supplement to that, we get a lot of research funding, primarily from the federal government. The US federal government is by far the number one funder of research in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we are no different than other uh, public universities and private universities in that we get most of our research funding from the federal government. We get some from the state government as well, and those are very important partnerships. But I, if, I, if I had to shoot at a number, I suspect probably about 80%, 80 to 85% of our research uh, funding comes from the federal government. So 80 to 85% comes from that stream, the federal government, the rest from state governments and private donors perhaps? Yeah, uh, state government is definitely second and then private funders third. And if, if you kind of look at the big pie here, what percentage of the University of South Carolina's income comes from tuition versus federal research dollars? So if I remember correctly, our total budget is somewhere north of $1.3, $1.4 billion. The total research funding last year was about upwards of $240 million, somewhere around that. We certainly want to expand that, and we have plans for that. Um, but it, it is a big piece of the pie. So this is a very interesting dynamic, and one not always very clear to folks from European universities, just how important the federal government is in, in funding research. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the kind of the background, the history of where that came from? It's a very American way of doing things, isn't it? Absolutely. it It's very unique. And I would say that it's the biggest reason why probably about 70 or 80 of the top universities in the world out, out of 100 are American universities. Mm -hmm. It has to do with that funding. This probably started back in 1862 with the Morrill Act, which was a, a partnership that was started between the federal government and the states to um, initiate land-grant universities. Mm -hmm. So that was primarily focused on agriculture and industry. And a lot of American universities were started during that period. And then I would say during the 1950s and 1960s, that partnership was reaffirmed and very much expanded mm -hmm. to focus then on public health, the defense industry certainly, and just economic growth in general. And that's where we, pretty much where it got, we, it got us to where we are today. So one of the ironies in all of this, I mean, here we are at a large Southern university and it's the Morrill Act that essentially kicked this off in 1862. And if my memory serves me correctly, the only reason it was passed is because the South was out of Congress at that point. The Civil War had started. They had voted against that kind of thing. They had voted against all sorts of things. They didn't want heavy federal investment. Yeah. Only in their absence could the federal government then pass that act. And now we're the net beneficiaries of this, right? Because, Absolutely. Because this is a fair chunk of change coming our way, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I think even, uh, if I remember correctly, Clemson University got their funding out of this act. That's right. I think yeah, it's entirely To, to initiate right. that, Clemson. So, so we're talking about federal funding. is very important to all universities um, and to the University of South Carolina in particular. How do we stack up with other universities, um, either regionally or nationally? Um, how successful are we in securing uh, federal government monies and, and dollars compared to other universities? So if you compare to the SEC, which are mostly Southern universities, we're probably below average, but um, we want to turn that around. We certainly want to be on an upward trajectory. If you look at universities like University of Florida, Texas A&M, I mean, they completely hit the ball out of the park. They're the They're, powerhouses, is that right? Oh, yeah, huh. absolutely. Texas A&M surprises me. I wouldn't have... Uh, Florida, instinctively, sure, I get yeah. that. Yeah. Why Texas A&M? Oh, land grant, is that why? It's land grant. Okay. They look, get a lot of funding for engineering, okay. defense. Uh, it's just a very strong... And it's a system. I mean, I think Texas is the only state that has two systems. Oh. So University of Texas and then the Texas A&M system and they're they're just very strong very interesting so florida texas where's georgia in this they're above us uh, but below uh texas a m and, and florida and they are on an upward tra trajectory for sure who would be um the biggest sc well 
southern university in terms of securing federal money? Is it Chapel Hill, maybe UNC? UNC, yeah. Off the top of my head, it's probably UNC. There are other universities that come close to it. Uh, certainly Georgia Tech is very strong. Uh, Duke is very strong. NC State. Um, all of them are very so, strong. So we have, we have our sights set on reaching those heady heights. Um, so federal dollars come from different institutes within the federal government. So you have, I mean, from my perspective as an historian, I know... Um, you know, the NEH and the NEA, yeah. right? Uh, but these are very small dollars. These are, in fact, I, my guess is that an, a National Endowment for the Humanities individual grant to a professor probably costs the university money, um, is my guess, because it caps out at a certain point and then the university has to pay your extra salary. But there's a kind of cultural capital attached to that, and that's just my guess. Yeah. But what you're looking at is much bigger. Um, what, are those, what are those institutes called, and what's the biggest one? The biggest one by far is the National Institutes of Health. I mean, they dwarf everything else. Um, they fund, as the name indicates, medical research. And their budget, I would say since 2015, has had a steady uh, uh, increase. And if things go as projected, they will probably be getting close to $50 billion mm. this year. Mm. A, uh, most of that actually goes to extramural funding. So that's just a, a piece of the pie that we want to make bigger for us. So the National Institutes of Health, uh, Health and Human Services, certainly uh, uh, provide funding as well. A lot of that goes for training, not just for research. And then we have other agencies, uh, National Science Foundation, which is probably second or third for us. We get a lot of grants from them in the STEM fields, energy, and then we have other federal agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Energy. We're actually very strong in energy research at South Carolina. So we get a considerable amount of funding from Department of Energy. So, so the key here is identifying which of those institutes has the most money to give in terms of grants. Yes. And so NIH is the big one. Yep. Um, how would you rank them in terms of you know, their budgets, how much they have? It would be... Um, NIH, NSF, then DOD or something like that? Yeah, you know what? I don't know off the top of my head. I know for us, it's certainly NIH and then NSF and then those other um, institutes uh, or agencies. But I don't know off the top of my head exactly what the ranking is. So your aim here, and it makes perfect sense to me and to anybody it would make perfect sense, is to go for the big fish, NIH money. Right? Yeah. And you have extraordinary experience yourself as a researcher because I want people to remember, yes, you are the VP for research, but you're also an active researcher and academic yourself, right? Yeah, I've been very lucky. I would say I found sort of my dream team here mm -hmm. at South Carolina. We recruited many of those folks to come here. We have a large team now. Our sort of our extended lab is probably around 60 people at this point. We do a lot of research, both basic science and applied science. Most of our funding comes for the applied science, which is um, understanding the effects of brain damage on people's ability to communicate. And we also do a lot of things in rehabilitation of those patients. But I would say probably more than 50% of my publications are actually in basic science, understanding normal brain organization of speech and language. It's an incredibly um, complex process and how the human brain deals with that is fascinating and it, it's, it's a big part of our research endeavor. And, and you, you're, you're able to p perform this research and pursue this research because you were very successful in securing money from the NIH, is yes. that correct? Yes. We have now, I think my lab is probably somewhere north of $40 million in funding from the beginning and it's increasing very fast mainly because now we're at a point where junior faculty and mid-career faculty that are come and sort of join our group, they become very competitive for research grants. So it's sort of a perpetuating cycle. It's, it's really nice. So, so the interesting thing about you here is that you are actually leading by example, right? You're not just saying to people, we need you to get more grants from the federal government in order to lift up the University of South Carolina. You are saying that, but you're saying, and here's how you do it. So um, 
you've got some initiatives that you've launched that have received very positive press um, in South Carolina. Um, you have a new Research Institute funding program. This is part of a pump priming uh, grant system. Could you tell us about um, what that is and what's the hope for it? So the Institute's funding program was actually something that President Amaritis wanted to make a part of his uh, first year. Uh, we're very lucky that he allocated a large sum of funding to this program. We know that federal funding agencies are gravitating towards center grants. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a single principal investigator who is sort of there by her or himself, with several graduate students or undergraduate students working, this is really going towards team science. Mm -hmm. So several principal investigators working on large problems. Uh, the NIH has uh, started this, the NSF is now doing more of this, and the other funding agencies are going the same route. We want to start five institutes within the universities that are t sort of take this team approach to science. Mm -hmm. So we want to tackle big problems but the idea is that at the end of the funding, which will, which is quite generous, which is about 500K per year for three to four years, mm -hmm. that team would then be competitive to go for an external grant to the NIH or NSF or some other funding agency. I'm excited about it because I think that these kinds of institutes are not just important for that group, but they are also contagious. They, other people see the success. You see the students that get involved with these large institutes, I can't imagine what it would be like, what it's like to be a student that is a part of um, a large endeavor like this. Instead of having a single go-to PI who is a mentor, you have a team of mentors. And this is also important for junior faculty. I think for junior faculty, a lot of times come in, they have huge pressures on them to go for tenure. And I, I, I certainly, just from my own experience, a lot of times you sort of feel alone. You feel like they, they're, there are these folks, these senior your uh, faculty that are telling you, here's the bar that you got to pass, but you're not totally sure how you're going to pass that bar. But having that team to to rely on for feedback and collaboration, it's priceless. So this is a very healthy reminder, Julius, of the function of this kind of um, priming, because it's not. It's not just about the kind of callous, cold securing of cash from the NIH. There's something deeper and more meaningful about this. I mean, plainly, we need more money, but we're coming at it from a pedagogical aspect that, that sounds to me, from what you say, fully integrates the undergraduate, graduate, and junior faculty experience with senior faculty. So it's that kind of latticing, which is very good. Um, and also some of the topics that you anticipate uh, funding, and I know you can't identify those specifically now, but they're really meaningful, not just to the state of South Carolina, but to the world potentially, right? Yeah. So what are some of those things that you imagine, um, those questions, those topics that you will interrogate in order to uh, secure the money, but also help the larger cause of humanity? Yeah. I would not rather not say what the topics will be. I think that will sort of take care of itself. One of the things that I hope that comes out of the Institute program is that we will identify pockets of excellence that mm -hmm. I'm not aware of right now. Mm -hmm. Now I've been here for 20 years and I feel like I have a fairly good understanding of sort of what are the areas where we're really strong. But I suspect, I mean, with 1200, or close to 1200 tenure line faculty, I know there's a lot of things going on here that are just not on my radar screen. And I, I wish I knew it all. I don't, I, I, but I hope that through these new initiatives, we will gain a better understanding of what are things where we should be putting uh, more resources into and where are areas where we can, with maybe just a little bit more help, we can help those folks sort of get to the next level with regards to their research endeavor. So, so yeah, there are always obvious gems, but there are hidden gems too. Yes. And yes. that's what's so exciting about this, it seems Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. So you went through uh, some of the heavy hitters that managed to get these NIH grants, um, the big ones in Florida and what have you. Um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that some of those places, you've mentioned Duke, for example, um, one reason why they're quite competitive or very competitive is because they have a particular kind of relationship with their medical school. Mm -hmm. 
And I should imagine that medical schools uh, can generate a great deal of funding from the NIH. Could you explain to us what, where our medical school is in this and its strengths and how it works? So I'll back up a little bit and tell you that earlier this year, I visited Virginia Tech University. Okay. They started a medical school about, I think about 10 years ago. And I thought, I mean, think about Virginia Tech, it's an engineering school. And so I was asking them, why, why did you go into starting this school of medicine? Was, it, was there a great clinical need that you wanted to fill? And what I could read between the lines is that the reason why they started this medical school was because they knew that without it, they could not reach the kind of funding levels that their board and their faculty expected. And the reason for that is the schools of medicine just tend to generate enor enormous amount of research dollars. So, and that of course translates into a lot of research. Our school of medicine, um, its charter was to mainly train uh, primary care physicians mm -hmm. to serve underserved areas in South Carolina. And that remains its charter. It's not a large school of medicine. Um, I think the total number of tenure track faculty members is I think 48, somewhere about that. But I would say pound for pound, they do really well with research funding. It's a small school of medicine, but the, the especially the basic science faculty do really well with research funding. Um, our clinical faculty are primarily tasked with seeing patients um, and they probably don't have the same research pressures that maybe you would say at Chapel Hill, for example, which is just an enormous medical school and they generate somewhere north of a billion dollars a year in research revenues. But our school of, Pub uh, school of Medicine has a lot of potential. I think we can increase the size of it, and I know for sure that we can increase the research footprint. At the same time, hopefully increasing the number of um, physicians that we train. And a lot of people don't know this. According to the U.S. News and World Report, we are the number one school of medicine in the United States in placing primary care physicians in underserved areas. That's very important. I think at least 50% of our graduates end up practicing in South Carolina. So we are probably number one in providing physicians to take care of rural South Carolinians. And this is a, a manifest and real and enduring return to the state of South Carolina, isn't it? I mean, oh, it's relatively a poor state. Uh, we need physicians in underserved areas, and that's precisely what our small but muscular school of medicine is doing. Absolutely. And as if I hear you correctly, you want to empower them to go for even bigger grants in the future. Is that right? Yep. We are building on the new Health Sciences campus, a building that is going to be focused on education that hopefully will increase our uh, number of students. Mm -hmm. But also we are building a very large research building. This is the largest uh, construction project that the University of South Carolina has ever gotten into. And that research building is going to be a game changer, not just for the School of Medicine, but also for the other health sciences. And where is that building? It's going to go on the Bull Street campus. So it's going to be straight across from Prisma Richland Hospital. What a showcase. What it's going to be it's showcase. going to be beautiful. Yeah. I am so hopeful. I think uh, anything from biomedical engineering to School of Public Health to pharmacy to nursing to social work, we can get our faculty together there. And I think the sky is the limit for what we can reach with our footprint. And when when's that due to be completed? Um, optimistically, four years from now. Okay. That's pretty quick, actually. It is pretty quick. We have been talking about this, I think, since 2008. Uh, since we knew that the VA, uh, which is where our School of Medicine is right now, that they wanted to end the lease that we have with them mm -hmm. in 2030. But now we got to get it done. Mm -hmm. Because without this new uh, campus, our School of Medicine will not have a home anymore. So, yes, I was going to ask you about this, this sense of urgency, and that's one quarter of urgency. Given the ratio of funding streams, you know, the state provides, what, 12% of our income, something like that, tuition, the bulk of it. Um, it's, these, this push to secure greater federal monies might become even more important over the next two to five years because of 
what is known as the demographic cliff, where you're going to get fewer students coming to higher ed, not just here, but throughout the nation. Right. Um, so is, is that also informing some of your decision making? I mean, we want to increase our research effort regardless, but it is certainly very much on the forefront of everybody's mind that this is coming up and one way to actually um, bridge the gap is with federal funding for research. I think our faculty are up to it and I think we can get there. I think it's entirely right. Um, It would be remiss of me if I didn't ask you about my neck of the woods. Um, And I don't mean London, I mean uh, the humanities and social sciences. So what we've been talking about so far is very much STEM, natural sciences, and that makes perfect sense given that the large funding streams are coming from NIH and NSF. What what role do you see for the humanities, history, English, anthropology, political science, and the social sciences generally in uh, elevating our research profile at the University of South Carolina? So just the scholarship as a whole, we don't just look at research funding as a marker of excellence, but our, for example, a total number of citations. Mm-hmm. It has to come from every department. Mm-hmm. It can't just be the STEM and the health sciences. It needs to come from the arts and the humanities. And of course, as just a part of our to- collective uh, scholarly product, the arts and the humanities are a big part of it, and the social sciences. On that note, one of the things that President Navaridis is starting for the, this, this coming year is the Excel program, which puts an unprecedented amount of money into funding the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And again, I'm hoping that that will elevate um, the kinds of scholarships and the amount of scholarship that, that those faculty can do with the extra funding. Yeah, I think it's extremely exciting, and I think this attention to the arts and humanities and social sciences it's refreshing because there is there is capital to be made. It's just perhaps just a different kind of capital, right? It's a kind of cultural capital, academic capital that yeah. helps lift all ships. Absolutely. Um, so I'm very encouraged to hear. I know lots of other people too are. And I mean, what your initiative here is generating a great deal of excitement among the faculty. Um, mentoring junior faculty, this has come up. Um, you mentioned it briefly. But it's, it's something of a passion of yours, is it not? Yeah. yeah. So when I came to South Carolina, I did have a faculty mentor who was not a researcher. Um, she was terrific. Elaine Frank, a lot of people at this university probably know her. She was the de- department chair of communication sciences and disorders for a long time. She was a great advocate for our department, but research was probably not her big thing. So I felt in many ways coming in as a junior faculty, in a school, of public, a school of public health where research excellence and certainly research funding is expected, in hindsight, I was very, I felt very much on my own. Like I was on my own. I had a lot of false starts, a lot of collaborations that went nowhere. I would like to spare some of our junior faculty that heartache, if you will. Mm. I think we can improve on our mentoring, which will take care of some of that. So in the past year, we started something called the Propel uh, Mentoring Program. Uh, focuses on grant writing for the NIH and the NSF. Um, It is not just focused on funding, even though that's a big part of it. What we're also hoping that will come out of that is just sort of mentoring for junior faculty to sort of show them the way. Mm -hmm. That they don't feel like they're alone and that they're a part of a team and that they make those connections with mid and, and senior career faculty, but also that they make connections with their peers. And I think that being a part of a group where sort of folks are going through it together probably makes things a little bit easier. But Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, it, I suppose people outside of the academy, outside of universities, don't, and there's no reason why they should see this, but academics kind of devolve on one of two things. For example, an historian very rarely works collaboratively. I happen to have done, but most historians write their own books. Same is true in English and the humanities generally, not exclusively. But in the STEM side of things, collaboration is absolutely essential. Uh, you're not going to get these center grants with one person. It just doesn't work that way, yeah. does it? And, and that's really, I think, where this mentoring is coming from, to lift everybody into a collaborative that can then translate into 
securing these centre grants, which are really probably the future of research at this university, right? Yeah. I mean, certainly single principal investigator grants are always going to be important, mm-hmm. but there's just going to be more money available for these centre grants. So we should go for it yeah. because it creates these sort of large groups. Um the only problem that I have with this is that I think that our tenure and promotion model really emphasizes independence. I understand why. You want to understand that if somebody gets tenure and promotion to associate professor, that they're on track to become a full professor and they can sort of be a leader of these kinds of endeavors. But at the same time, I think perhaps it penalizes uh, collaborations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that maybe we need to take a look at our tenure and promotion guidelines. I have not talked to the provost about this, okay. but I really do feel like we should be awarding and we should be encouraging um, collaborations because ultimately it's not just improving quality of life, but also it probably is where uh, science is going, so into team science. Yeah, I also think that's probably true of the humanities too because uh, team taught courses are some of the most entertaining, interesting and memorable courses you'll ever take, especially if you have two professors teaching, I don't know, something about the 19th century uh, US, but they have opposing views. Mm-hmm. And students really love that kind of grit and that that civil to and fro and it teaches them how to debate. Yep. And I, I, I'm entirely in agreement with you. I think that collaborative work is a real place for it but it's a little bit too ahead of our structure as it currently exists. I think the structure needs to catch up a little bit in order to incorporate it and reward it more fully. Yeah. You know, in our group, we have several senior senior and junior faculty. There's a lot of debates in our lab meetings and we have lecture series. I mean, debate is just a part of what we do and modeling for the students, the postdocs and the junior faculty that it's okay to disagree. Yes. Actually, it's welcome. Right. We enjoy good debates and as soon as the debate is over, it's nothing personal, we move on. And so it's an opportunity for those who are up and coming to understand debate is essential to progress. It really is. And I think most listeners outside of the university will, will be surprised to hear that debate in science, I mean, it's presented as a fait accompli because we hear the end result, but there's a lot of intellectual exchange underwriting that end result. Oh, yeah, and, and unfortunately, I, I think that in the media and the public, that kind of debate is, is, is sort of con- portrayed as, oh, they don't know what they're talking about, they can't agree. They don't get it that this is actually a part of the process. That's right. You, you need to argue through the tough questions, that if somebody is going down the wrong path, there needs to be some kind of a mechanism for course correction, and debate actually provides that. And it's okay to be wrong sometimes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's good to be wrong sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been, built my entire career on being wrong about many things. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, that is so true. And I, I think that that's just a part of science. I see people say, oh, this study that was so important, now they realize that it was wrong. Well, at the time, it was the best we could do. That doesn't mean that science doesn't work. It works really well. It has have, has moved us forward in medicine and, and all kinds of areas of, of human life. But part of it is, being, is making mistakes. It is. It is. And unfortunately, we live in something of a, a culture that fears failure. And I, I do think that failure has a really important role to play in success, oddly enough. I couldn't agree more. So let's project. Um, We're in 2022. Let's project five years from now. And your initiatives have gone through. Um, what, What does the University of South Carolina's research profile look as a result of the initiatives that you launched this year? Like in an ideal world, where do you want to be? Obviously, I want our research funding to go up. But what I want to have changed is that when faculty that are successful, when they get targeted by other universities to to move, which happens quite a bit, mm-hmm. I want them to think twice because of the quality of our university. I want them to think this is really the place to be. And so that will certainly make our recruitment of faculty a lot easier, mm-hmm. but also Just as importantly, it will make our retention of faculty easier because folks want to be at a place that is probably prestigious, but also a place that is supportive of their scholarship. And I want us to be in a place where our faculty feel wanted, they feel supported, and I think where they feel like the future 
of their um, enterprise is at this university. Nicely put. Um, is, is there anything else you want to add about what's going on in your office, um, aspirations, anything you'd like to add that you think is important for people to hear? We want to, we want to work on all fronts. I would say we want people to come to us with ideas. My door is always open. We are certainly working with the health sciences. We are working with uh, uh, our STEM uh, faculty in engineering on big things. Um, what I've told the state legislature and our board of trustees is that in addition to, to achieving excellence in scholarship, we want to focus on South Carolina problems. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. I think that our state needs to see. I think we already do this. We. We are certainly um, huge when it comes to um, supplying the job market with our graduates, but also a lot of our research already actually focuses on South Carolina problems, but I wanna increase that. And so both in health sciences, with regards to engineering, the University of South Carolina really can be a powerhouse and a major force for good for our state. Julius Fredrickson, Vice President for Research at the University of South Carolina. Thank you for being on Take on the South.